Hello, you're listening to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest today is Professor Enrique Guerra Pujol from the University of Central Florida College of Business, and we will be discussing his excellent paper, uh, Girdle's Loophole. So welcome, Enrique. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for the invitation and for the kind words, and um, I'm very happy to be on the podcast. Excellent, excellent. So um, I got to say, I I love the paper. It's both like a really kind of engaging thought experiment in constitutional law, but also a fantastic story. So I, I wanted to start by asking if you could just share the story with us. Tell us what happened and, you know, what got you interested in this particular subject and what was the sort of backstory with Girdle that got you thinking about this issue? Absolutely. It's um, on a personal level, you know, I've always been uh, fascinated by mathematics and logic and uh, Goodell is, uh, you know, considered the uh, very important, uh, had made very important contributions uh, to those fields. And so, I had, you know, I'm mean, no expert in, uh, you know, logical uh, uh, theory and uh, uh, mathematical, uh, higher mathematics, uh, but I, I read plenty of uh, biographies of, um, uh, of Goodell, uh, including uh, John Dawson's very excellent uh, biography, uh, among many others. And I was reading a, a fairly recent, one of the more recent ones by Rebecca Goldstein, and, you know, she retells the anecdote that I'm about to tell, and this, and this was, you know, about maybe... Uh, let's see, we're 2018. This was maybe uh, eight, seven years ago. And just a light bulb uh, flashed in my head that, you know, no one has really uh, investigated the story. And what it, and, and what it has to do is um, the, uh, the story is that Goodell uh, discovered a, it's reported that he discovered a very deep logical flaw or logical contradiction in our uh, constitution. Yeah, and but, it's but, but, story. But what I love yes. more than what I love more than anything is how it comes out, right? Yes, yes, it's it's fascinating. You know, you, you know, what got me to write the paper and to really go back to all the sources was that we're talking about you know, and if I, and if I just you know borrow my uh, you know sort of the language of my of the street, you know, talking about Kurt Effing Goodell here. You know, we're talking about <laughs> you know the, the smart. You know, any room he walks into, he's the smartest guy in the room. He's even um, his bi- one of his biographers, uh, Hao Wang, describes him as the uh, second greatest logician after Aristotle. And so, <laughs> you know, that, yes, that was the light bulb. I mean, it, we're talking, you know, uh, 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 prior to the paper, it really, uh, this has been sort of um, more of an oral or verbal lore. You know, uh, uh, everyone's retold the story many times. And uh, as I said, it's in passing in many of his biographies. Um, just because of the colorful nature of the tale. But I thought, you know, if the guy is half as smart as everyone is saying he is, and most assuredly, I can assure the audience that he is, uh, Goodell, uh, that is, uh, um, you know, then then, then perhaps it is worth to explore what was this uh, deep, uh, you know, logical contradiction or flaw in the Constitution. Um, and, And so that's what sort of generated my interest in this particular topic. Yeah, so, 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 so maybe just tell, tell the specific story, because I, I just love how it actually happened, like how it came out that he, or at least apocryphally, how it came out that he discovered this, this flaw, because the context is so great. Oh, absolutely. I would love to share the story because it really is, it really is worth retelling, especially for any listeners there who are, may not be familiar with the anecdote. Um, and with this, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, I-, I think there's a lot of truth to the tale, uh, but um, uh, let me say it this way. Um, let me back up. Um, this all occurs in the context of Goodell um, petitioning to become a United States citizen. And this is, you know, a very important topic sort of today in the news and, you know, the idea of citizenship. And it's very interesting that when Goodell left Central Europe, as many intellectuals did during the 1930s, uh, uh, um, 
uh, he decided to follow in the footsteps of uh, fellow um, uh, colleagues of his. He was at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton, such as uh, Albert Einstein, with whom he was good friends. And in fact, there's a great story saying that Einstein um, chose to remain at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton, of all the places he could have gone, um, solely to have the uh, honor of walking home with uh, Goodell at the end <laughs> of the day. Uh, <laughs> yes, they were very good friends. And, um, and so um, he decides, along with Einstein and other uh, intellectuals from Europe, to become a United States citizen. And it's very important that we are talking about Goodell, who really made these very um, important um, contributions to the foundations of uh, mathematical theory and, and, and logic. And so um, we can begin to imagine that he very much took his citizenship exam uh, very seriously. And here <laughs> I'll just back up. Yes, yes. I mean, he, he really, in, in fact, in the, um, um, one of his witnesses, and I will say back at that point in time, the procedure was a little bit different. Um, if one wanted, if one was a foreign national and one wanted to become a citizen, one would uh, first um, submit a, a declaration of intention with the fe directly with a federal court. Generally, it'd be the district federal court, uh, the, the, the uh, yes, federal district court you know, closest to where you live. In the case of um, uh, uh, Goodell, who was in Princeton, it would be the federal district court in Trenton. Mm -hmm. And then the second step would be there would be a hearing. There would be an examination hearing with a Article Three federal judge um, to determine the fitness of the applicant. And then if you uh, if the applicant uh, passed that hearing, then and only then would there would there be the naturalization uh, ceremony in which one would take that oath of citizenship, mm -hmm. uh, in which one would pledge allegiance and uh, support to the United States. And so um, he were talking about that those first two steps where. Goodell, uh, and subsequent to publishing the paper, I was able to, through the Library of Congress, uh, obtain an original copy of this, uh, 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 um, of his Declaration of Intention. And he, you know, he was um, very concerned about the hearing. And um, according to one of his witnesses, Oscar Morgenstern, um, he, his other witness being Albert Einstein, famously. <laughs> of all people. Uh, remarkable. <laughs> if, yes, if, if one looks at the documents, you'll see their names there. And I will tell you both, of course, Einstein needs no introduction, but Oscar Morgenstern is a very um, uh, uh, important person in his own right, as he is considered uh, by mathematicians and economists as one of the co-founders of modern mathematical go uh, game theory. He, along with Johnny von Neumann, a very important person in mathematics as well. In fact, it was von Neumann who really, um, uh, back in the early 1930s, who recognized the importance of Goodell's work and was very instrumental in bringing him into the Institute of Advanced Studies. Mm. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, whether we're talking about game theory or relativity theory, uh, uh, here comes Goodell, you know, um, into the court now. Uh, his hearing has been scheduled for the first week of December of 1947. He brings his two witnesses and the account, um, uh, my retelling of the story is based on a memo, memorandum, that Oscar Morgenstern, as I said, one of the witnesses, uh, wrote um, many years after the events. I believe it's dated 1971, but describing sort of firsthand um, what occurred at this citizenship hearing. Um, and I mentioned this because although, you know, decades, uh, there's an interval of decades, right, between the actual citizenship hearing in early December of 1947, I believe December 6th, 1947 in Trenton, um, and his um, committing all this stuff to paper, uh, it's the only first-hand account we have. Mm. All the other accounts are based on this oral tradition that sort of grew out of um, uh, there at the Institute of Advanced Studies. Mm -hmm. And so, um, according to Morgenstern, uh, and by the way, the way the story is ordinarily told, it's that uh, um, uh, Goodell made this uh, discovery of a contradiction on the eve of his hearing as if you were cramming uh, the very last minute. <laughs> but, but really, <laughs> and that, of course, adds, uh, probably the movie version of this ever is made into a movie. That's how it will be depicted. But in fact, according to Morgenstern, um, Goodell spent weeks, uh, weeks, uh, you know, really preparing for his citizenship hearing. And not only did he study um, American history, uh, with a, uh, uh, um, but also constitutional law. And we can only begin to imagine, uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, mind as brilliant as Goodell, uh, you know, uh, studying uh, the, the text of the Constitution. Um, and the story is that, um, uh, as Morgenstern relates it, is that he 
discovered this contradiction. Um, and, and in fact, I, I'll quote from the memorandum. I'm not quoting from Morgan Stern, uh, uh, saying that Goodell, his colleague, rather excitedly told me, Morgan Stern, that in looking at the Constitution, much to his distress, Goodell's distress, he had found some inner contradictions, and that he could show in a perfectly, how in a perfectly legal manner, it would be possible for someone to become a dictator and set up a fascist regime. Never intended, of course, as by those who drew up the Constitution. Now, the reason why I take this seriously, another reason why I take this story very seriously is because we're not only talking about someone as smart as uh, Kurt Goodell, um, but we have to understand that uh, Goodell, and in the case of Goodell, many other intellectuals such as Einstein left and von Neumann left Europe um, in the beginning of the 1930s, uh, right there with the rise of Adolf Hitler um, and totalitarianism uh, expanding uh, across the European continent. Goodell does not leave until 1939, mm -hmm. uh, when it's, uh, he's, he's, he's apparently about to be inducted into the, uh, you know, the German armed forces. Mm -hmm. And so, although he was Austrian, but Austrian by that time was annexed um, by uh, Germany. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, if you put yourself, if you begin to put yourself in the context, regardless of how smart Goodell may have been, because we, as even smart people may have far-fetched or harebrained uh, schemes, uh, but, you know, he lived in this interbellum period when, in fact, uh, and this is, of course, relevant to perhaps uh, events of today, when many countries uh, that were, uh, uh, had democratic institutions, many Central European countries with democratic institutions, um, uh, either new or in some cases dating back to the 18th century, um, you know, be, gradually became dictatorships. And a sort of fascinating example of this we could look no further than uh, Mussolini's I Italy, mm -hmm. because um, fascist Italy is no, you know, there's no, of course, there's no, uh, I, I don't see there's any revisionist out there saying that that was not a fascist, you know, uh, country, but, what, but there's a lack of consensus as to the timeline, right? Mm -hmm. When did, you know, when, on which exact date did uh, uh, Mussolini convert Italy into a dictatorship? It was very gradual, uh, you know, and we, we won't have time in this podcast to, uh, delve into the uh, you know constitutional history of, of Italy, but uh, I use that simply as an example to show that the so-called Albertino Statute, which was enacted in 1848, served as a proto-constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, then, when after the unification of Italy uh, became uh, uh, sort of the de facto constitution, um, that was never formally repealed or, or uh, uh, amended, in, um, uh, um, and, and yet, of course, uh, Italy became fascist. And, and in fact. I will further preface this by saying, if you look at the entire history of uh, uh, the interbellum period in Central Europe, almost every single country in that region, uh, in fact, went from, either, you know, from democratic or quasi-democratic parliamentarian systems to, uh, to dictatorships. And so this clearly has had to be, uh, I think, a very legitimate concern uh, uh, in, in, in Goodell's mind. Mm -hmm. and, and so... Um, the irony, though, is that neither Morgan Stern nor, nor Einstein um, wanted nothing to do with this theory. And really, one could put yourself, in, you know, yeah, uh, and, and their position in that uh, this is a uh, formal citizenship here. Yeah. Uh, they well, did agree and, to serve as... And more yes. than anything, I love the judge's kind of recorded response. Yes, Judge Philip Foreman. So before we talk about Judge Philip Foreman, and there was a number of irregularities in his, and this is often not very uh, 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 common knowledge, uh, even those who do know the story of, uh, of uh, the reported discovery of a contradiction in the Constitution by Goodell. Um, it's, uh, 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 as we were saying, Morgan Stern and, and Einstein agreed to serve as his witnesses, and in fact, both, they all three drove together. Uh, I believe Morgan Stern was at the wheel and Einstein was in the passenger seat uh, with Goodell in the back seat um, on their way to Trenton. And uh, according to, again, the, the Morgan Stern memo, uh, they're trying to distract Goodell so that he doesn't think about the, uh, you know, doesn't even think about mentioning it, you know, <laughs> let alone going into the details of his, of his theory uh, of the contradiction. Uh, but it turns out that when they enter the courthouse, and I don't know to what extent uh, uh, Philip, uh, Judge Philip Foreman was uh, expecting them, or if it was truly a coincidence, but Judge Philip Foreman is the person who had conducted Einstein's hearing. 
and who was the judge presiding over Einstein's naturalization. And granted, Einstein's uh, uh, world famous by this time. And so when he sees the three men in the hallway, he says, well, come on in. I'll, I'll go ahead and do the hearing. Now, by, yes, yes. So all three attended the hearing. And why this was unusual, perhaps even irregular, is that um, based on the federal statutes at the time is the judge is supposed to interview the character witnesses separately from the applicant. Right. So the character witnesses are in the privacy, right, of the, uh, uh, in the judge's chambers um, uh, or hearing room, as the case may be, um, uh, without the presence of the applicant. But here, just simply because of the perhaps reputation uh, of these three individuals, um, and I would imagine even with a formal hearing, this was something of a pro forma uh, event, um, all three were present. And yes, and Judge Philip Foreman, um, and, and, and I see why. Uh, all the various uh, versions of this story, they all agree on one thing that uh, Judge uh, uh, Foreman believed um, uh, Goodell to be, to be of German uh, origin, German, German citizen, when in fact uh, he was Austrian citizen. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is because actually a, an error was made in the um, Declaration of Intention um, uh, where uh, whoever filled out that form did list uh, Goodell as, as a German national as opposed to mm -hmm. Austrian. But once that is cleared up, and Goodell quickly clears, uh, clears that up, um, uh, then the judge says, well, in either case, uh, uh, a dictatorship could not happen here as it did in Germany and, of course, with the annexation of Austria. And that, of, of course, is the uh, uh, Goodell uh, quickly, uh, according to all accounts, um, uh, uh, disagrees with the judge and says, no, 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 uh, that, uh, I, that can happen here and I can prove it, the famous words. And we're talking about a, uh, uh, a person who has devised a very uh, um, uh, advanced proofs previously to this. So, um, mm -hmm. and as you were now mentioning, the judge's reaction. And I was very, uh, uh, researching this uh, whole incident, I, I was very saddened sort of by the judge's um, uh, uh, response as well. Let's not get into that. You know, <laughs> you don't <laughs> Let's not get into that. <laughs> We're here for a purpose. It's naturalization. Right. Let's not worry about constitutional theory today. Exactly. Let, let alone uh, 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 the possibility of a deep logical contradiction in the Constitution. But of course, wearing my researcher hat, right, and I hope I, my, uh, the, our audience shares uh, our curiosity, you know, what is the uh, logical contradiction? And um, Right. I mean, that, it really is the tragedy, isn't it? Right? I mean, that... Yes. Here is this great logician, one of the greatest minds of the 20th century, who says, I have this revelation about constitutional theory, and everyone's response is, oh, no, no, let's not go into that. <laughs> and it's, let's it's, not go into it. It's, it's yeah. lost, right? I mean... And it is lost, and in fact, I analogize this to uh, uh, Fermat's lost theorem, you know, another uh, uh, a reported famous discovery of the 17th century by... Uh, one Pierre Fermat, who actually had training, a formal training as a uh, as a lawyer. Huh. Um, uh, he was also a uh, perhaps today we would consider him an amateur mathematician, but he made important contributions along with Pascal to probability theory and other aspects of of mathematics. Um, and he is reported to have discovered a a um, solution to a uh, mathematical problem, which he had written on the margin, but that margin has been lost to history. Uh -huh. And in fact, the actual proof. Uh, by one Andrew Wiley uh, at Princeton uh, is a very complex proof, you know, spanning many, many pages. Uh, and so uh, it, it is, you know, it's, it's it, once we, uh, once we clear the underbrush of the story of Godel and his discovery and realize that nobody had bothered to write it down, let, let, you know, let alone Godel himself, mm -hmm. um, um, it, it, it's, we are in the area of speculation. Now, my contribution here is, is that I have no idea. I think it's, it's simply, you know, uh, idea of making plausible inferences, good guesses. But I, 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 I like to draw a distinction between what I consider Gudelian, you know, potential Gudelian defects, and what I call non-Gudelian defects. And, mm -hmm. and what I do here is I draw an inference. Um, uh, this takes us a little bit into logic and all this mathematical theory, but the idea that Gudel himself was very much fascinated about the problem of self-reference. Um, and in fact, there's a beautiful uh, book, uh, Doug um, Hofstadter, the uh, Godel, uh, um, Esther, and Bach, uh, the Golden Thread, that sort of a popular version uh, of trying to explain how the problem of self-reference and uh, self-reference, the role it plays in uh, uh, Godel's uh, seminal contributions, uh, 
to to logic and mathematics. And so, um, uh, so I it, I speculate that perhaps any potential you know if there is a, a deep logical contradiction, it would have to be one involving self reference. Mm. But it is a fascinating story, and it's fascinating. You know, I I consider possible reasons right why neither Morgan Stern or, or Einstein, um, uh, let alone you know Judge Philip Foreman, uh, why none of them um, um, you know may, really wanted to um, uh, uh, thought much of uh, Godel's uh, uh, discovery, and and the, in Foreman's case, I can really I can understand the context really does matter, and uh, and uh, you know he's a busy man, uh, he you know wants to get through the hearing as long as he's able to confirm. Uh, uh, Goodell's fitness, uh, character uh, fitness, um, um, and, you know, and his rudimentary knowledge at the very least of the Constitution, he need not go into these more advanced uh, topics. But Einstein, uh, you know, Morgenstern. Uh, Morgenstern, I mean, as far-fetched as the theory could be, the discovery could be, it cannot be any more intricate than the um, axioms of utility theory uh, that him and Johnny von Neumann uh, put to writing in, in their seminal book on the um, economics and the theory of games. Uh, so uh, Morgan Stern was no dummy, you know, and uh, and Einstein, I, I should say, um, Einstein, although, you know, his reputation as a scientist and a great physicist, of course, is uh, what he may m most be known for, but he was actually involved in many political causes at the time, and, you know, causes involving world peace. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was very much involved in uh, politics and uh, uh, social matters. And so, um, I, I, I'm, I'm fairly surprised that there, none have left an account of Godel's, uh, Godel's discovery. Yeah, yeah. So in your paper, <clears throat> which I love, by the way, you, you, you sort of put yourself in Godel's shoes as best you can and try to come up with an account of what the logical contradiction he might have seen could have been and like you say it's sort of all about self-reference in a constitutional sense so i was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about sort of your um your your attempt to tease out what 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 he might have thought Yes, absolutely. You know, and subsequently, I should say this is um, I, I shouldn't get credit for this. Um, others such as, uh, you know, I mean, we're talking about giants here like Larry Tribe and uh, Jerry Gunther, you know, in constitutional law um, have um, considered this. Um, what I do is I sort of delve into greater detail in the paper, but I consider Article 5 in particular. First, let me just say what I think Godel was not thinking about. I mean, I think there are other possible defects in the Constitution that if um, if abused could lead to this concentration of power. Uh, one, of course, could be the Commerce Clause. Uh, Congress has, you know, since almost every human activity affects commerce in one way or the other. Um, when you combine the Commerce Clause in Article 1 with the Necessary and Proper Clause, one could argue that Congress has almost untrammeled authority. Mm -hmm. um, even cases like Lopez versus United States and uh, uh, Morrison that uh, 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 purport to strike down congressional enactments for lack of a nexus to commerce. Um, those um, Congress simply disregarded those decisions and reenacted those laws. Um, in one case, the Violence Against Women Act, and the other case, the uh, um, Guns Free School Zones Act, um, simply by adding the relevant commerce uh, clause language. Uh, that mm -hmm. con and Congress knew that there was a necessary nexus. Um, and so, uh, but that, and I agree, that could be a you know a serious concern. Um, uh, but it's, it doesn't involve self-reference. Uh, mm -hmm. I also consider perhaps Article 2, uh, a, a Constitution commits the commander-in-chief power to president. Now that we have a standing army, one could see the abuse of that power. Um, but again, but again, I, 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 I see it almost as too obvious uh, for a mind as Godel. And even, you know, Morgenstern said, look, uh, Einstein, right, uh, consider uh, Godel's theory to be somewhat more uh, elaborate than that. I, I, I even consider a possible possibility of Article Three, right? The judicial review power. Uh, if when you combine this with cases like Cooper v. Aaron, where the court has said that it has the uh, not only the ability to interpret the Constitution but it has the final word, one could see that power abused as well. Though we normally don't think of judges as abusing uh, power or acting unconstitutionally as a matter of logic, 
there's no reason why a judge could not act, uh, you know, in excess of his or her powers. So I ultimately go turn towards, I even consider Article 4, by the way, you know, the admission of new states and one could create, um, there's, and there's actually a very famous law review article I have since read, uh, mess with Texas, you know, the idea of maybe creating uh, 10 different little states within the current boundaries of Texas, you know, and then, a, you know, perhaps with the admission of so many new states, uh, because here's the thing, it's very difficult to amend the Constitution. One needs two-thirds approval of both houses of Congress, and then three-quarters approval of either state conventions or state legislatures. And so, uh, but again, that's a very elaborate um, and, and not self-referential. So I end up with Article 5. Um, and Article 5 is the amendment uh, 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 article, or the, uh, contains the amendment procedures as we were just talking about. And, um, and what's interesting about Article 5 is Article 5 tells us there's two parts of the Constitution that are unamendable. One being the, um, well, uh, this has now become moot, but one being the um, provisions dealing with the regulation of the slave trade, sort of as part of that constitutional compromise of 1787 uh, Congress would not be allowed to enact any legislation interfering with the slave trade uh, until 1808. The other entrenched provision in the Article 5 is, of course, this is very relevant today, uh, <laughs> equal representation in the Senate, right? That is unamendable. Uh, there has to be equal representation in the Senate, regardless of a state's, you know, a demographic or population composition. Um, but aside from that, uh, one could argue, if one is in a Godelian mindset, that Article 5 itself is amendable. And so this is where I go into um, ungodly detail in the paper where if Article 5 then is amendable, um, then perhaps, uh, and, and I should note, um, scholars have made some proposals uh, to this effect, uh, which, uh, which I would be uh, more hesitant uh, about these proposals. But for example, one could amend the constitution to eliminate, for example, the three quarter ratification uh, provision uh, requirement of the state legislatures. Uh, by way of example, or perhaps reducing, uh, amending Article 5 to say that a s simple majority vote in the House and the Senate, or in just one of the houses, um, suffices for an amendment. And I consider that as a potential Godelian defect, because what you're amending here is not any substantive provision of the Constitution, you're amending the amendment procedure itself that's mm -hmm. set forth in the Constitution. And that's where the self-reference comes into play. And um, now that may be far-fetched, I know, um, um, uh, I should say, and um, I've done some research, there were a number of constitutional amendments being considered in the 1940s. Uh, none, of course, dealt with Article 5, uh, but there was a lot of talk of constitutional amendments in the air. Um, and, and so um, uh, I could see where a, a person of Goodell's uh, intellectual stature, his uh, cultural and political background and being in Central mm -hmm. Europe, during this very dangerous dictatorial interbellum period. Um, and then combined with the fact that a, a number of constitutional amendments were being debated, uh, that that possibility, uh, uh, if extended to Article 5, perhaps kindled Goodell's imagination. Uh, yeah, that too. Well, I, I mean, like, and in context, it makes sense, too, because in a way, the totalitarian moves that were so present for him you know, in recent European history, were also, in a sense, legal moves. I mean, Hitler and Mussolini both came to power through kind of facially legal means. So the kind of formalistic concerns, although, you know, in retrospect, they seem, you know, maybe a little bit implausible, must have been much more, much more real in that moment. That is exactly right. And you know, we have to put ourselves in that historical context. Uh, remember, uh, 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 President Delano, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had just passed away, right? After uh, winning his four, unprecedented fourth term in office, right? And um, a lot of the laws enacted by Congress um, did expand uh, federal power. Um, uh, not in the same degree, of course, as in fascist Italy or Nazi Germany, but certainly, certainly it's not, and of course, the election of uh, Donald Trump in uh, 2016, of course, re really um, has reinvigorated this debate and this discussion of uh, the possibility of 
using legalistic methods, could there be a dictatorship? Uh, you know, could there be a concentration of power? And I, I really believe that the, the example of Nazi Germany is a very, uh, and specific, I should say, specifically, the so-called Enabling Act of 1933, in which uh, the Reichstag, the uh, German parliament, um, in essence, amended the uh, constitution of the Weimar Republic, the 1919 constitution, in such a way as to allow Adolf Hitler to rule by decree for a period of four years. Now, of course, that was extended indefinitely later, but um, now, and those were, that was uh, a different um, provision, not similar, you know, not uh, identically worded as our constitution, but the parallel was there, right? And I think uh, a lot of times, and this is sort of a larger point, um, uh, uh, my colleagues, North American constitutional law scholars, uh, I teach a course in business in the constitution at the business college, um, we can be very insular, right, and focus on our, the U.S. Constitution due to our, the permanence of our country around the world. But when we take a look at these other constitutional traditions, and specifically what occurred in the interbellum period, uh, where in some cases you had uh, these uh, at least formally legalistic uh, 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 mechanisms to create dictatorships, uh, certainly it's not far-fetched at all. Um, and so uh, I hope this paper... Uh, uh, maybe reinvigorates uh, interest and uh, others can perhaps um, zero in on uh, or have a, a better uh, theory as to what the uh, contradiction might be. Yeah, well, it certainly got me thinking and it's really a great read. So I'll, I'll make sure to include a link to the paper as well as the, the well, supplemental you. materials you provided uh, on the page for the podcast. And, and Enrique, it's been great talking to you about this and I was just wondering if, if there was anything you wanted to kind of leave the audience with or any final thoughts about your paper. Well um, thank you for, for the invitation once again it was really a pleasure to uh, do this podcast. I, I hope our paths uh, cross again and really my only final thought is um, I think um, and I include myself here I know our audience is waiting for uh, you to turn the tables around and uh, you need to be a guest on your podcast with all the fascinating scholarship. Uh, one of my favorite papers is yours on the Zabruder, uh, Zabruder film, the John F. Kennedy you know, assassination and, uh, um, and your work on uh, Erie B. Tompkins revisiting the facts of that case. So I hope you get to be on your own podcast as a, as a guest uh, one day soon. Oh, well, thank you so much. I hope to. I hope to. And Enrique, it's been great. And uh, I'm thank sure you. I'll see you soon. Yes. Okay.